Okay, so we are now going to move to another kind of solvers for ordinary differential equations and some algebraic differential equations. And Carol Woodward from Lawrence Livermore is going to talk uh, to us about the uh, suite or family of solvers, uh, sundials. So welcome and thanks. Oh, there's a, yeah. Okay, so I guess it's unmuted. I don't hear a difference. Do you hear a difference? He okay, hear. he can hear. Okay, well that's good. All right. Well, uh, I know this is uh, the middle of the week and it's the middle of the afternoon, <laughs> so uh, I'll try. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about sundials, which is a suite of nonlinear and differential algebraic equation solvers. And uh, this, this set of packages has evolved over a number of years, going back probably now about 30 years. To, if we go back to all of the predecessor codes that have come up and given us the technology that we have in the codes today. So um, I'm going to overview the sundials package and then talk a little bit about ODE and DAE solvers in general and what we're looking for and why we have uh, the methods in the packages that we have. I'll talk a little bit about nonlinear systems and the solvers that we use and uh, invoke both in the ODE solvers but then also in Kinsol, which is our Newton Krylov solver. We have uh, sensitivity analysis embedded in both the uh, time integrators that we have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what sensitivity analysis is, why you might want to care about it, and then the different approaches that we have implemented. I'll talk about some of the usage of sundials and some of the upcoming additions and where we're going with the packages right now. Okay, so Livermore has had a history of ODE and DAE methods and research uh, that's gone on, like I said, for almost 30 years. Um, Starting really with the release of the ODE pack software in the 1980s, this is a package that, for those of you who are around, um, I guess you used to get these things on Netlib. You know, you do the FTP and, and the email requests. And, um, but uh, there were probably two or 300,000 downloads of ODE pack in its various incarnations, and lots of people use it. And I still get calls from somebody who's got a chemistry code that uses some very ancient version of the ODE solvers that we have. And they were really, really pounded on, worked on, and, and used over many years, um, which gave rise to a number of different methods and extensions uh, to try to meet the challenges that were coming out of these codes. So first codes were all written in Fortran. There was the VODE, which was a variable order ODE solver for stiff and non-stiff ODE systems. It used direct linear solvers. And the next big advance that came in was the preconditioned Krylov solvers, in particular preconditioned GMRES, and getting those in to the ODE solvers uh, gave rise to the VODE PK package. And then there was the Newton Krylov solver uh, technologies that came in, and NKSOL was developed. This was the first code that was developed for doing Newton Krylov nonlinear solvers for PDE based systems, okay, that Brown and Saad put together. And uh, some of the technologies that were in the Newton Krylov solver came into the ODE solvers and propagated through. There was also DAS-PK, which was for DAE systems, and that came about from DASL back when uh, Linda Petzold was also at Livermore. So the codes that we have come about from, from these Fortran codes. They've gone through a number of, of developments over the years. Our recent focus has been on sensitivity analysis, new nonlinear solvers, and then support for the new architectures that are coming in. And I won't say a whole lot about these last two things yet, or today. So. We have CVOD, 
which is a C rewrite of the Vode, Vode, P, Vode PK family of codes. This happened in the early 90s and was the first move to C from these Fortran solvers. Okay. And this came about, was motivated by our, our push to solve very large parallel systems and being able to take advantage of a lot of technologies that were coming in and move from Fortran to C was, was needed there. We had PVOD, which was a parallel version of CVOD, but we actually reverted back to the CVOD name after that because uh, what happened is we realized we could put all of the parallelism into the vector module, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, and actually not touch the core integrators. And so the CVOD code itself was the same uh, after we did a little more thinking about it, and uh, we went back to the CVOD name. So there's Kinsol, which was the C rewrite of NKSol, which happened in the late 90s, and Ida, the C rewrite of DASPK. Okay. And then in the early 2000s, we moved to doing sensitivity analysis, and we had initial versions of the CVOD code, the Ida, and Kinsol. And then those, based on what we learned from that, we did a complete rewrites of those to come up with CVOD S and Ida S okay, in the late 2000s. And so these have all been organized now into a single sundial suite, including CVOD, CVOD S, Ida, Ida S, and Kinsol. And that's what we have today, and that's what I'll talk about. So our design, uh, we, we've designed to easily interface with legacy codes. You know, so if you wonder why, why do we have Kinsol and why do other packages out there exist, um, we try not to be a big framework. We try not to take over your data structures. The Sundial codes are often used by people who've had codes that have been in existence for a long time. The model's been validated. Uh, and the idea is to try to bring in newer time integration technology without having to rewrite data structures. And that's where, where we come in. So the idea that we try to adhere to is to keep codes very simple to use. Uh, we have Fortran interfaces for CVOD, IDA, and Kinsol. We also have MATLAB interfaces in the Sundial's TB, uh, so Sundial's toolbox for CVOD S, I, that should be IDA S now, and Kinsol, I believe. Uh, I won't say anything more about the MATLAB interfaces, but if you have questions, you can send us some mail, and we can certainly talk more. They're written in, in a data structure neutral manner, and by that I mean all of the operations in the time integrators and the nonlinear solvers are in terms of operations on vectors. Okay, so we take, uh, we add vectors, we scale vectors, we dot product vectors, or take norms of vectors, but everything is written in terms of interfaces um, to activity on vectors, and then a user can put in any vector that they want underneath, or use the ones that we supply. Okay. So we make no assumptions about how an application lays out its data, is the key point. We have a modular implementation, so I described that a little bit with vector modules, but the linear solver modules are uh, pretty uh, well encapsulated as well, so the users can easily swap out linear solvers underneath. And we try to require very minimum problem information, but offer user control over all of the parameters that are governing the solver in particular. So. Okay, so let me say a little bit about initial value problems uh, in general, and then I'll come back to, you know, what are the methods that are in CVOD and IDA, and then go back into the, the methods that are in Kinsol. So the general form of initial value problem is given here. We have a nonlinear function of time, uh, some solution x and its time derivative, and we want to find the root of that, and we have an initial condition, okay? So we can say that df dx is invertible, and if, or if that's invertible, then we could solve for x dot, to obtain an ordinary differential equation. Okay, so you can put this into an ODE form. That's not necessarily the best way to phrase some of these problems, but uh, I do point that out. Else the IVP is a differential algebraic equation. Okay, so DAE has differentiation index I, if I is the minimum number of analytical differentiations needed to extract an explicit ODE. Okay. So stiffness. We, I always get asked what, what makes a set of equations stiff, and there's absolutely no good answer to that question. Um, I like the definition that Asher and Petzold put forth in 1998. If the system has widely varying time scales, okay, and the phenomena that change on fastest scales are stable, then the problem is stiff. Okay, so I like that. But how do you know if that's, that's happening in general? It's going to depend on the Jacobian eigenvalues, the system dimension, accuracy requirements, the length of the si simulation, right? Um, you may see fast modes die out, but if your length of situa simulation is very short, you may not see that, and so it's, it's not going to necessarily look, look like that. Um, in general, you can say a problem is stiff on an interval 
if the minimum real part of the eigenvalue is bounded well below negative 1. Okay, so that's, that's another definition that people... Okay, so when we talk about ODEs and DAEs, we always like to talk about the Dahlquist test problem because this is how we can introduce stability and stability requirements and why you might think implicit methods versus explicit methods for a given problem. So the Dahlquist test problem, uh, time derivative of y is equal to lambda y with an initial condition y not, has an exact solution given here. Okay, so it's an exponential. And so there's a notion of an absolute stability requirement if the magnitude of the solution at a given time step is bounded below or equal to the magnitude of the solution at the previous time step. Okay, so we don't have a divergence off to infinity. Okay. If the real part of lambda is less than zero, then y at time n decays exponentially and we cannot tolerate any growth in y if we want to have stability. Okay. So we can look at the, we can define the concept of a region of absolute stability of an integrator written as yn is equal to uh, some the real part of z times yn minus 1 with time step size z equals h lambda and define this region as the uh, numbers in the complex plane such that r of z is bounded by 1. Okay. So we'd like for this condition to hold if we want to have absolute stability of a method. Okay, so uh, just to exemplify what, we, what stability requirements mean and, and how they can impact a, an integrator, let's consider forward Euler. Okay, so yn is equal to the previous step plus an update uh, looking like delta t, so h here is delta t, times uh, f of yn minus 1. Okay, so that's this. Um, our region of absolute stability is going to require 1 plus h lambda um, I'm sorry, R of Z is going to be 1 plus H lambda. So if lambda is less than 0, forward Euler has the step size restriction that H must be bounded by 2 over lambda. Okay. For backward Euler, the same thing as forward Euler, except we're evaluating our uh, problem-defining function, our F, at Yn instead of Yn minus 1. And so here now, R of Z is 1 over 1 minus H lambda. And if we look at what we require uh, for stability, H just needs to be positive. Okay, so this is effectively no, no stability requirement on the time step except that we're going forward in time. Uh, whereas here we have a, a definite requirement. Okay. So let's look at an example. Y down to minus 50 times Y minus cosine of T, or lambda here now is minus 50. Okay. So here's what the solution curves would look like. Uh, solutions with respect to time for different initial guesses, we see that they all kind of come into this common manifold, this stable manifold. If we have time step looking like 2.01 over 50 with forward Euler, and remember the stability requirement required h to be less than 2 over 50, or 2 over lambda, but 50, then we actually see divergence. We see the solution going up and down, and it doesn't, doesn't come down into that stable manifold. For h equal to 1.97, that's the red. So we're getting, we're, we, we do meet the condition and we see that we do oscillate a good bit, but we do start coming down into that, that manifold. And for h equals 1.875, we definitely come into that. Okay, so you can see as we, we um, meet the condition, we can capture that manifold. How fast we can capture it depends on, on how much we can, uh, how tight the time step is below that. Okay, for implicit schemes, let's look at backward Euler. Uh, if we have just a straight backward Euler with uh, time step equals to 0.5, okay, uh, we see we start with initial condition here, we can come up and then we capture that manifold pretty quickly. Okay, much bigger time step. If we, just as an example, we apply CVOD with its BDF methods, uh, it takes an adaptive step and we get onto that manifold very, very quickly and track it. Okay, so Sundials has implementations of linear multi-step methods, uh, both in, or for implicit. Um, a linear multi-step method is going to look like this in general. So it's a linear combination of prior states and prior deriv time derivatives at those prior states. Okay. We have two methods that are in CVOD and, and IDA. Items molten for non-stiff 
systems and BDF for stiff systems. So BDF is backward differentiation formula and backward Euler is a BDF method of order one. Okay, so just so you can see the relation between what we just did. Okay, uh, and you see for the atoms molten, K1 is equal to one here, so we've got one prior state. Uh, K2 is equal to the order of the method and we can go from first to 12th order. So quite a few prior derivatives. Uh, for BDF now, uh, one prior, I'm sorry, um, a number of prior states related to the order of method, but uh, only the current time derivative comes into the formulation of the method officially. Okay, so for every time step, we can define the method through defining the alphas and the betas. And once we have that, then we're going to need to solve it in uh, a nonlinear system. Okay, and that's the cost of solving with an implicit method, is you do have a nonlinear system that you have to solve at every time step. With an explicit method, you do not have this. You might have these prior uh, function evaluations defined in terms of prior states, okay, but not the current state. So here for the ODE system, F is evaluated at Y in, and so we need to find we need to find the zero of this equation that's an implicit function with the nonlinear function f. Okay. For a DAE, similar thing, we have an implicit equation with the nonlinear function capital F that defines the differential algebraic equation. Okay. Okay, so these are the BDF methods. Uh, stability can be very restricted for higher order BDF, and for both CVOTE and IDA, we have methods implemented up to order five. And I'd like to put up this plot because uh, it does help to explain why sometimes we can be running and we're running CVOD and we can see some weird behavior and we cap the order at two and life gets good. Um, here's our multi-step method. We find that the regions of instability grow with the order. Uh, so here the shaded area for each order, k equals one, so first order through order six. Um, the stability, the, the method is stable outside the shaded area. So when k is equal to one, we have very small region of instability. When k equals two, it's very small, but when k equals three, we start getting much bigger and we start crossing into the complex plane. And for k equals four, five, and six, and we can see it at order six, we have a very small region that is stable, okay? And so uh, we have seen er areas where uh, CVOTE is, has failed and we've capped the order at two where we're guaranteed to stay um, away from the complex plane, we are able to guarantee stability, and we have a situation where uh, the, the code goes much more smoothly. Okay, so we have implemented um, an optional stability limit detection algorithm within CVOD. It is based on linear analysis because we haven't uh, been able to do a nonlinear analysis yet for the problems. Uh, it limits the step if it detects a potential stability problem. So it just basically calculates the step. If we're seeing stability problems, it just cuts it. Okay, so it's not, not a super intelligent algorithm, but it tries to do something, uh, tries to detect if that's happening and, and brings back the step size. Okay. All right, so let me talk a little bit about each one of our solvers. CVOD solves y dot equals f of ty. Uh, as I said before, using BDF and implicit atoms. Uh, for the stiff case, it applies, in, uh, so the BDF methods, we apply an explicit predictor to give yn of zero. So this uh, depends only on prior states. So this is done explicit. It does not require a nonlinear solve, okay? This gives us yn of zero. We can then use that as the Im, uh, first iterate for the nonlinear solve that's required in the implicit corrector, okay? Time steps are chosen to minimize the truncation error. So to, we can estimate what the truncation error looks like uh, through the theory of these methods. We can take difference of the corrector value and the predictor value, and based on that size and the constant that's appropriate to the system, um, we can get an estimate of what the error looks like, and we can accept the step if an error condition is true, okay, and reject it otherwise. Now this error condition involves a weighted root mean square norm, and the weighting is relative to tolerances the user inputs, an absolute tolerance for each unknown in the system, and a relative tolerance for all unknowns. Okay. All right, so the idea is that we try to choose the steps and make sure that we have an error condition at every time step that abides by the tolerances the user is putting in. Okay, so we're taking time steps that are based on error rather than a, hmm, Time step of half looks good. Okay, so very often 
we get into a situation in applications where people just try to use a step that works um, and not necessarily try to base it on error. And, and it, it is nice that these conditions are embedded in CVOD and IDET. Okay, so we can also estimate the error at the next step by taking a ratio of the step sizes and uh, weighting that with the error of the current step and choose the next step such that the estimated error is going to be bounded by one. Okay, so we're trying to choose a step such that we, we hope, we believe, it will satisfy the error condition. Okay. We also vary the method order. So we can estimate the error for the next higher and lower orders okay, by changing this Q right here. Uh, and choose the order that gives the largest step, time step meeting the error condition. Okay. So there's a lot of variability, a lot of adaptivity that's built into these time integrators, but the idea is to satisfy an error condition and not just use the highest order or the biggest time step. Okay, okay so what does the weighting look like? Uh, as I said, the user put, specifies an absolute tolerance for each component of the system and a relative tolerance for all of them. We then calculate a weighting uh, as the reciprocal of this relative tolerance times the solution for each component plus the absolute tolerance, and then put that into uh, a root mean square norm. Okay? And we actually bound the error condition in terms of uh, not just one, it, it's actually one sixth, with the one sixth being a safety factor. Okay? And uh, Alan Hindmarsh was at Livermore and was the author of a lot of these codes. And I once went in and said, why one sixth? Why not one fifth or one fourth or one seventh? And he said, you know, it worked on most of the problems, but the other ones didn't work on most of the problems. <laughs> so um, it is a heuristic, and it is something that uh, we don't have a good theory to say that's the best thing to do. But uh, it does tend to be very robust, and it does work very well. So. Okay, nonlinear systems are going to need to be solved at every time step, uh, so we need some nonlinear solvers. We use the predicted value as the initial iterate for these nonlinear solves. Um, for non-stiff systems, we do have a functional iteration embedded in here uh, for the Adams uh, methods, so that, that's kind of like a fixed point iteration. Okay, so y in m plus one, so the iterate for m plus one is equal to a function of y in of m. Okay. For stiff systems, uh, fixed point tends to be very slow, and so we have a Newton method implemented. And here uh, we would have m is an approximate Jacobian times our step is equal to minus the nonlinear residual. Okay? And this m is going to be something that looks like the identity minus gamma, which is a coefficient embedded with the um, time step size and coefficients of the integration method. Okay, times the Jacobian of our uh, problem-defining function for the ODE case. And for the DAE case, we have the Jacobian plus gamma times um, the Jacobian of F with respect to Y dot. Okay. So Sundials provides many options for linear solves. Uh, we have a good suite of iterative linear solvers. This results in an inexact Newton solver. Uh, scaled preconditioned solvers are provided uh, GMRES, BICG, STAB, TF, QMR. I should say our, our preconditioning that we supply is very, very minimal and does assume that you're using our vectors. We often send people to Petsy or other packages, SuperLU, for good preconditioners. Okay? That's where you start needing to really own the data structures, and we want to keep out of that space. And with other really, really good libraries online, uh, we figure folks are, are better off going there. Um, we only require matrix vector products with the Jacobian uh, matrix, and those can be approximated, so I'll say something about that in just a minute, um, if you're using the, the Krylov methods, that is. Okay. Uh, Jacobian information can be supplied by the user or estimated with finite differences, so if you have the Jacobian, we can certainly um, bring in a, a routine that, that a user would supply that does the matrix vector product itself. Um, we also provide uh, some din direct dense and direct band solvers, uh, but again, you have to be using our data structures. So very few people uh, tend to use that, and those tend to be in the serial case. But I do point them out because they are there, and they can make initial implementation much, quick, much quicker to test. Okay, so Krylov, uh, an inexact Newton Krylov method can be used to solve the implicit systems. Krylov methods find the linear system solution to a Krylov subspace. So I won't I figure you guys are probably seeing that in other talks, but um, 
you can basically see that, that one of the things that you're doing is powering up the Jacobian, so it's not unreasonable to think that a matrix vector product is going to be required at every iteration with that Jacobian. Um, but we can take a finite difference by approximating this Jacobian vector product by a directional derivative, so we can take, but the cost is another evaluation of our nonlinear function that we need to solve at every uh, step. Okay. So there is a cost associated with doing this finite difference, but it does remove the need of actually forming Jacobian or doing the matrix vector product. Okay. Okay, and so I, I, my comment is, you know, the matrix entries need never be formed, great, but the memory savings is usually then used on a better preconditioner. So there is a trade-off. Okay, Ida, this solves f of t y y dot equals zero. Uh, using, again, the variable order, variable coefficient forms of the BDF methods. Um, it targets implicit ODEs in index 1 DAEs and Hessenberg index 2 DAEs. If you have a harder DAE than that, we don't, we don't help you. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll just, just point that out. Uh, things start getting very, very difficult at that point. So um, anyway, so, so I do point out that's what we target. Uh, the option, we do have an optional routine for solving for consistent values of y and y not dot. Um, so the, the issue that comes up with DAEs that you don't see in ODEs is that you've got this uh, nonlinear function of y and y prime, and often you know what the initial condition for y is, but you don't know anything about the initial condition of the first derivative with respect to time. Okay. So having optional routine for that that does work only in certain cases, so semi-explicit index 1 DAEs, um, where differential components are known, in the algebraic components are not unknown, or all of the um, why not does, does the why not prime is specified, but you don't know why not. Okay, so uh, it does only work in certain areas, and it's the only way we could keep things pretty general. Okay, and we do allow for constraints in IDA, so assuming keeping certain components positive, negative, or greater than or equal, or greater than or less than zero, or less than or equal to zero. Okay. Uh, one thing that we have found a number of uh, folks wanting to do is to do root finding along with the time integration. So we have supplied uh, a root finding capability with CVOD and IDA, where we find the roots of user-defined functions GI, some fun function, the, which are some functions of t and their solution, or in the case of Ida, the solution and its first derivative. So roots are found by looking at sign changes over time intervals. And so because of that, that mechanism, we do have the caveat that we're only going to find roots of odd, odd multiplicity. Okay. So this is not an area that I personally have spent a lot of time with, but I've been told that if you have something that is of even multiplicity, you can often reformulate it so it looks like something with odd multiplicity. But I'd be interested if somebody's got a, a problem where, where they're not able to do that, and I'd enjoy talking to you. Okay, uh, it checks each time interval for a sign change, and when a sign change is found, it applies a modified secant method to find the root with a very tight tolerance that's based on unit round off, um, well, two orders of magnitude above unit round off, and then scaled by you know, the time size. It checks for, uh, a root every time the function is evaluated, and if it is found to be zero, then the root is reported. When we do have zero, we do compute um, the value of the function at something just past the root for some small delta in the direction of the integration. Um, we stop if that's also zero because we're not going to be able to be assured that uh, we have a non-zero at some past value of t if we continue on. Okay, so that would be a problem. Okay. Can solve. This solves algebraic equations, f of u equals zero. It is a C rewrite of the NK sol code. Uh, primarily, we were shooting for doing Newton Krylov methods, but we're starting to expand the scope of that. Uh, we use an inexact Newton solver, so we're solving j delta u equals minus f of u, approximately. We provide a modified Newton option with direct solves, which freezes the Newton matrix over a number of iterations. Okay, so this is something that comes up a lot in the time integrators that we want to do, uh, but we also provide that with um, the uh, direct solves because once you've gone to the work of factorizing that Jacobian, you want to hang on to that and amortize that cost as long as it's, it's valid. Okay. 
Uh, we have, again, the GMRES TFQ MARM by CGSTAB uh, Krylov solvers with optional restarts for GMRES, and we allow for preconditioning on the right. Uh, we have direct solvers, dense and band, serial, and uh, for special structures only. We allow optional constraints, very similar to IDA. We can scale the equations and or the unknowns. So very often we have folks working with uh, very large implicit systems where there's lots of different variables of different sizes running around and scaling becomes absolutely essential to getting both a good stopping criteria and getting uh, good calculations going through. And we also have dynamic linear tolerance selection. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So let me talk about Newton's method. Uh, Basic idea of Newton's method, this is diagrammed here in 1D. We are solving f of x equals 0, starting with some initial iterant. And we want, uh, so we would repeat some iteration, which I'll define in just a minute, until we get the norm of x to be small. Okay? And the idea is, let's say we start over here. So this red part here, we make a linear model of f okay, that's tangent to the curve. We find the 0 of that. We evaluate our nonlinear function. Make a linear model of that, find the zero, evaluate the nonlinear function, et cetera, until we converge. Okay. So that's what it looks like in 1D. Um, and each, iter each time we, we uh, you know, find the zero, evaluate the function there, we can iter update our step uh, in, with, that, um, with the, the solution to that linear model. Okay. Uh, there is a lambda here on the step length, and that is because we can apply a damping parameter such as one would use in a line search in order to uh, make sure the method stays well behaved. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we might choose uh, the tolerances and how we solve this linear system. Okay. okay. So linear, linear stopping tolerances can be chosen to prevent what we call oversolving. So when we're far from the, the solution, that linear model is not necessarily a good model of that nonlinear function. But when we get a lot closer, um, as you can see here, we start seeing that the, the solution looks linear. Okay, that's often the case. Sure. Um, so the idea is that we don't want to go to a lot of work solving the linear system when we're far from the solution because that's a lot of effort that's really not going to help us. Okay, so the idea is can we choose the tolerance on the linear solve so that it dynamically constricts, okay? And how, how would you do that? So uh, the linear system is solved to a given tolerance. Uh, this is the, re, um, the residual of the linear system. If we bound it in terms of some parameter times the, the norm of the nonlinear function, then we can start saying we can get some convergence out of the, the full Newton method with this inexact linear solve. Um, so this talks a little bit about what I, I just said. And so Eisenstadt and Walker in 96 came up with two really nice choices for how we might choose eta here in order to allow some adaptivity in the, the linear system tolerance. Uh, their first choice, choice one, looks at the fit of the nonlinear function and the predicted value of the nonlinear function used or coming out of the linear model of the previous iterate. Okay, so the previous iterate makes a linear model. How good that predicts what the nonlinear function did is measured here through the numerator, okay, and then we scale it by the size of f, and that gives us a uh, value for eta. And the idea is that as we get closer to solution, that prediction should get better and eta will get smaller. And then they equip this with some safety factors and things too. Uh, choice two looks at the rate of convergence of the nonlinear uh, iteration. So how fast f is going to zero factors into how fast eta then goes down, okay. All right, uh, and if you look in the ODE literature, A to K is 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Uh, people use a lot of uh, very uh, non-fancy <laughs> ways of choosing A to that actually can work very well for many systems, okay? And sometimes they tend to be a little more robust. So uh, I always point that out because it's, it's something that's worth trying. Okay, so uh, why do we use Newton's method in all of these, and why am I talking about Newton's method? Um, it tends to be a very fast method. So convergence of Newton's method is Q quadratic locally for some constant C. So what does that mean? The error, so how well X matches the solution X star to give an iterate, is going to be bounded by the square of the error at the previous iterate. Okay. So that means, and, and the condition for this theory is that X the initial x0 is close enough to the solution that you're in the ball of convergence of the sequence of the iterates. Okay. 
So what that means is as you get close enough to the solution, you start seeing the error in Newton's method drop really fast. Okay, you can start getting convergence very quickly. And Newton's method can be a really, really effective method. For the ODE integrators, that usually means once we apply the predictor, we can get something pretty close to the, the solution and get ourselves in that ball of convergence and do very well with the correct, the nonlinear solve for the corrector, which is why we do predictor corrector. Okay. Okay, uh, for an inexact Newton's method where we solve that Jacobian system inexactly, we have conditions on eta in order to say something about its convergence. So the inexact method will be linear if eta k is constant in k, so that 0.05, okay, that would give us a linear convergence of the nonlinear method. Super linear if the eta's uh, change with k and limit to zero. And quadratic if we can say that eta k behaves like the norm of f. And the Eisenstadt and Walker methods are Q quadratic. They were able to show that. Okay. okay, we have a line search globalization in Kinsall for Newton's method. The user can select either just a straight up inexact Newton method or Newton method with a line search. Uh, the idea for the line search is to provide more flexibility in the initial guess. Uh, what that translates to is larger time steps. Um, People do use Kinsall very often in time integration, so every iteration of their time integration loop they would call Kinsall. Uh, they don't necessarily have as good of an initial guess as they may want, and the idea is if you put on the line search, they can get a little bit more robustness. Okay. I will say that there are very many times where we've turned on the line search and we see failure to converge, we turn it off and it converges. A little further down the line, the reverse might be true. So it's, it's something we like in the toolbox, but I don't necessarily uh, guarantee it, it will always work. But I bring it up because it's something that, that folks like to, to be able to have to try. And that gets into the choice of lambda for this damping that I mentioned earlier. Okay. And so the idea of the goldstein armio conditions, which is the line search that we have implemented in Kinsall, is to ensure sufficient decrease in f relative to the step length, to ensure a minimum step length relative to the initial rate of decrease, and to adapt to full Newton step when we're close to the solution. Okay. Okay, I won't say a lot about preconditioning because I know you guys are getting talks on Trilinos and Petsy and some of the other um, uh, linear solve uh, packages that do a really nice job of preconditioning. Um, I'll just say that we allow, we have hooks for it, so we allow for preconditioning. When you're using the Krylov methods, you pretty much have to use preconditioning, especially if you've got a large uh, system that you're solving. Uh, for Kinsol, you have to supply two routines, uh, the setup of the preconditioner, so evaluate and pre-process what the preconditioner is or anything that you might need for it. Um, and then the solve, so something that gets executed at every linear iteration, whereas the setup might be once every nonlinear iteration, okay, or, or fewer if you want. Uh, so the idea is that the user can save and reuse approximations to the Jacobian as directed by the solver. Um, and, you know, we've had users that have used Hyper, Petsy, SuperLU, lots of different uh, packages with, uh, with the Sundial's codes. Okay. We do supply a band and block banded preconditioner uh, for use with our uh, serial vector structure only. But, uh, you know, I'll point that out. It is there. Okay, sensitivity analysis. So sensitivity analysis is the study of the, how the variation in the output of a model, so numerical or otherwise, it uh, can be apportioned qualitatively or quantitatively to different sources of variation in the input. Okay. How sensitive is your model to a change in the data that's going into it is basically the, the idea, the question that you're trying to answer with sensitivity analysis. So applications that come up, model evaluation, model reduction, data simulation, uncertainty quantification, optimization, all sorts of different cases in optimization. Um, you see it, uh, we've, we've had a lot of users of sensitivity analysis doing combustion type problems where they want to remove species that don't affect the system much. They don't necessarily know a priori what those species are so they can do some sensitivity analysis and find that out. Um, two different approaches that, that people use are both forward sensitivity analysis and adjoint sensitivity analysis and we do have both CVOD and IDA equipped with both. So uh, I'm not gonna say a whole lot of depth here uh, the basic idea is this is the DAE system that, say, Ida is solving, and we consider parameters P, that is some data that's entering into the problem, okay? And we want to understand how X changes with respect to P, okay? And we might have uh, 
Yeah, and our initial condition may be dependent on P as well. Okay, so for forward sensitivity analysis, we can just differentiate this, this nonlinear function f uh, with respect to P and get a nonlinear, I'm sorry, get a linear uh, ODE to solve for this sensitivity S, which is dx dp. Okay, and so one could imagine solving our initial DAE system and augmenting that with sensitivity systems that we also solve for each P. Okay, so for every P, we solve an extra equation. Okay, now if we're looking at a spatially varying system, we've now doubled the amount of memory we're going to require to solve. Okay, so these aren't free, but it can be a very, very useful thing. Um, and so we can get these sensitivities and evolve the sensitivities and solve that. And so we provide the infrastructure to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about how that's done. For adjoint sensitivity, the idea now is that we're solving an adjoint problem. And the idea is that you've got some quantity of interest and you want to understand how the quantity of interest changes with respect to your parameter. And the way that that's formulated mathematically ends up being an adjoint problem which runs backward in time. Okay? And so since we had the time integrators in place, we figured we'd provide all the infrastructure to be able to go backward in time as well as forward. So the user does the forward integration, does the backward integration, they can get the, sense, the adjoint sensitivity out. Okay. And so the, the basic thing is, you know, how do you know if you want to do forward or adjoint sensitivity? Well, if you have um, a lot of, of things that you want to get the sensitivity to, um, I'm sorry, you get this right. <laughs> So, okay, the computational cost of forward sensitivity analysis basically increases with the number of parameters, the number of, of uncertain data parameters going into the problem. Okay, and it's going to look like 1 plus NP times the number of unknowns in X. Whereas in adjoint sensitivity, we're looking at the numbers of quantities of interest that starts governing the size of the problem. Okay, and your sensitivities uh, go into that. And so if you have lots of different quantities of interest that you're looking at, you would want to use forward sensitivity analysis in very few parameters that change. But if you have lots of parameters that change, i.e. you're going to have lots of extra equations at, you know, for different S's, then you're going to want to use adjoint sensitivity analysis. And if you've got a lot of parameters and a lot of quantities of interest, it's a tough problem. <laughs> okay. All right, so forward sensitivity analysis methods, um, it really comes into how you formulate that sensitivity equation. Because it is a derivative of the original nonlinear equation, we're able to approximate it through finite differences without extra information from the user. Okay. So uh, we have implemented what's called the simultaneous corrector method, where on each time step, we can solve the nonlinear system simultaneously for the solution and the sensitivity variables um, using a block diagonal approximation of the combined system Jacobian uh, and we also have the staggered corrector method, where on each time step we converge the Newton state for the state variables and then iterate to solve each sensitivity system separately. So kind of like a, a full solve versus a gauss seidel solve for the linear solvers, uh, folks among you. Um, OK, I don't want to say any more about that. The generation of the sensitivity systems, uh, you can, uh, OK, so for the, this isn't showing up too much, but um, for the sensitivity systems, you have a DF, DX, and a DF, DP that you need to worry about. You can look at formulating um, each one of those guys separately, such as one would do here, or you can formulate the full right-hand side of the sensitivity system taking derivatives of, taking directional differences of F uh, with, e with um, sorry, with increments in each of the variables, right? So. It's different ways of doing it. Um, each one's going to require more evaluations of F. The question is how expensive those are, how expensive the different evaluations uh, are for your problem and, and what you want to do. Okay. But we, we do supply both of those options. Okay. Adjoint sensitivity. Uh, the big thing here is integration backward in time. And the problem that in order to do the time, backward time integration, you need to know what the forward solution is at any random point. Okay. The idea is that we do the backward and time integration. We also abide by error conditions on the backward integration as well as the forward integration. Okay. So we can't just say, well, let's just use the same time steps going backward that we used going forward because that might give you very inaccurate backward integration. Okay. So uh, what, what we've implemented in the code is a checkpointing system. 
where the user specifies a certain number of checkpoints going forward. And then what happens is when we go backward in time, we will uh, say we need to know what the solution is, the forward solution is here. Well, we will reintegrate from the prior checkpoint uh, exactly like we did the first forward integration to get that value here. Okay. So the cost will end up being effectively three integrations to do the, the adjoint sensitivity. The original forward integration, the cost of the backward integration, and cost roughly of about one more forward integration to get the solution at all the intermediate points that you might need. Okay. Okay. Uh, generation of sensitivity system for adjoints. Um, we do allow the user to supply an analytical system. Uh, we, don't, we do not provide the uh, adjoint system for you. The user does need to provide that in some way. So it could be done through an analytical means, so just direct computation of what the, the adjoint system is analytically. Uh, folks can do that through automatic differentiation or through finite differences. Finite differences tend to not be very um, cost efficient, so we don't recommend that in general. Okay. All right, sundials, vectors. Um, so I've said that all of our, our codes are implemented on, in terms of operations on vectors. So the data vectors, the, the, the data vector structures can be supplied by the user. Uh, we try to allow that to make sure that people are able to have their very complicated data structures that they're able to preserve and, and use a lot of the optimizations they've made on their, their native data structures with, underneath our code. Um, so a generic uh, in-vector module defines the content structure, which uh, as far as uh, Sundial is concerned is a void star, and an ops structure, which is the pointers to the actual vector operations supplied by a vector definition. So if you supply your own, you have to supply also how to operate on the vectors. So you've got your vector structure, but you need to tell Sundial, okay, this is how you add two vectors, or how you dot two vectors, or things like that. Um, Okay, so, and then there are routines that are necessary to clone vectors. So given a vector, can you make more vectors that look like that? Okay, because what happens is you initially, uh, you initialize these solvers with a vector and then it will create extra memory space that it's gonna need based on, on that one using these clone routines. And I'll note that all parallel communication within these codes resides in the reduction operations, dot products, norms, mins, et cetera. And so there's, there's nothing that we assume for parallel communication. Okay. okay, we do provide both a serial and parallel uh, vector structure that people can use, that, um, where the, the vectors are laid out as a direct array of doubles for stride one access. Uh, appropriate lengths, both local and global, for the vectors have to be supplied for that. Um, Let's see, all vector operations are provided for both serial and parallel cases, and uh, we use MPI for the global reductions in the parallel case. And I'll, I'll point out that the really nice thing is these do serve as good templates for people to use in creating their own. Okay, okay Fortran interfaces. Um, Cross-language calls do go in both directions with, uh, with sundials. So the Fortran user code goes to the interfaces, which goes to CVOD and then back. Um, so the Fortran main would call interfaces to the solver routines, the solver routines would call interfaces to the user problem defining function and preconditioning routines, et cetera, and, and vector routines. Um, all, for portability, all rut user routines have fixed names, just to keep it a little more simple, and examples are definitely provided for that. MATLAB interfaces, um, the core of each interface is a single MEX file which interfaces to user-specific user callable functions. Um, the guiding design philosophy here was to make interfaces equally familiar to both Sundials and MATLAB users, okay? Uh, so I know this is a workshop in high-performance computing, but we still have a lot of MATLAB users, so I'd, I'd like to include this, this slide anyway. Um, I think it helps a lot of people to see how to use the codes uh, through MATLAB too. But, um, so all user-provided functions we assume to be MATLAB M files. All user callable functions have the same names as the corresponding C functions. Um, and unlike the MATLAB ODE solvers, we provide a uh, sundials approach in which the solve function only returns the solution at the next requested output time. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so we do have example, uh, examples and documentation for that. Okay, so general structure of, of sundials. I apologize, that's not readable. Somehow the font got messed up again. Okay, I thought I'd fixed it. Um, basically, we've got sundials, CVOD, CVOD S, IDA, IDA S, and Kinsol, and there's a lot of common code between IDA, IDA S, and CVOD, and CVOD S, right? The, the sensitivity version is S, but it's a lot of the same integrator files that are at the core of those. Um, then we have specific interfaces to the linear solvers, and then the generic linear solvers that we provide, and then the, the vector structures, okay? And so I will say, um, SPGMRs are scaled preconditioned GM res, SP, BG, BCG for BICG stab and, th and things like that. We have had a number of users that pull these generic uh, implementations of the Krylov functions and actually use them in completely other applications, not using sundials. But we tried to have all of the sundial specific interfacing to those solvers happen in the layer, you know, up here, so that these could be pretty generic solvers. Okay, um, so Sundial's code usage, similar across the suite, we have a series of set get routines to set the options. So for CVOD with a parallel vector implementation, it would look like this. Um, we have all the includes that we need. We create a, a vector, um, so some vector Y, we're calling the new vector routine. We would create the, mem the CVOD memory block, um, call a bunch of set routines based on what we want to do for the integration, any parameters, initialize the CVOD uh, solver, set up the, the linear solver, and then uh, for every output time where we want to dump the output, we call CVOD and it will integrate to that point. Okay, And we specify the, the final time to integrate to and then it comes back. Uh, so often people put the time integration inside their own output loop. Okay got to destroy the vector and, and then free up the memory. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, forward sensitivity analysis in sundials uh, kind of works just like the, the state, except that now we need to have a specification of the problem parameters and an activation of the sensitivity computation. And then uh, the options would include the sensitivity approach, so simultaneous or staggered corrector methods. Um, how are the, the sensitivity residuals computed, so analytically with finite differences, AD or whatnot. Um, the error control for the sensitivity variables has to be specified, and user-defined tolerances for the sensitivity variables. And once we have that, uh, then you know, it works similar to what we just saw with the, uh, the forward, or the um, base integrator. Okay, so that would look like the following, where now we're including things that are gonna be more specific to CVOD S. Um, so as before, we have the, the new, the create, the set, the uh, malloc, the, the linear solve, and now we have a new vector array. So we have, to, we have a notion of an array of uh, vectors uh, that we have that are the sensitivity vectors, and so that would go into YS. We would set um, the sensitivity parameters, malloc the, the memory that we need for that, and then um, call CVOD and then call gets get sends to get out the sensitivity values, okay? And then, of course, have to destroy the extra memory we've created. Okay, so it's still a CVOD mem structure. The CV mem structure is, is the same one uh, between the core integrator and the sensitivities. Okay. Adjoint sensitivity, um, similar to what we saw with the forward, except now we need to, instead, we're, we're doing backward in time, we need to uh, discuss or uh, uh, specify things related to the checkpoint approach um, and how we're specifying the adjoint system and things like that. Those all need to be uh, set up. And again, we both we use both uh, CVOD S and IDA S. So those are equipped for both the forward and the adjoint in the same, same module. Okay. Okay, so now... Uh, we have a, an adjoint malloc that we need to bring in. Um, CVODF, uh, create the new for the backward integrator solution. Okay, set up the backward integration parameters. And then we have to call a backward integration, okay, after we do the forward. So this is all the forward stuff, that, like we saw before at the top, and then we do the backward. 
and then have to destroy the backward solution as well as the forward. Okay. Okay, so upcoming additions to sundials. Um, one of the things that, that we found is the Newton method is as wonderful and fast and as much as I, I love Newton's method. Um, we're finding that some of the accelerated fixed point methods are becoming uh, fairly efficient on some problems and people are starting to look at these more and more. And so we're putting in an Anderson acceleration. Actually, Dina Hanoon over there has been spending her summer uh, getting our user interfaces in Kinsol for this straightened out. And um, we've got a preliminary version in place and we're refining this and, and trying it out on our first application. So that'll be coming probably in the next year. Uh, we're also looking at vector kernels supporting mini and multi-core architectures coming online and kind of looking toward the next generation, how we might be able to provide efficiency there. Uh, first place would be looking at the, the vector kernels, but then also looking at the integrators and seeing what kind of parallelization we would need to change there, if at all. And then um, I'll say a little bit more in depth here, but we've got Dan Reynolds from uh, uh, Southern Methodist University working on um, additive Runge-Kutta methods. And so... These are going to come online in the next year as well. Uh, a new set of solvers that will extend sundials to support multi-rate systems of ordinary differential equations. So we may look into the DAE systems, but that's not going to be in the next year, but for, for ODEs. So like CIVO, these solvers are going to apply advanced error estimators and adaptive time stepping to effectively evolve systems of ODEs, but will allow the user to decompose the ODE into fast and slow components and then apply implicit and explicit solvers uh, to these components as needed, okay, so to be able to s support the IMEX uh, integration. So they're based on these additive Runge-Kutta methods, which are comprised of a pair of uh, explicit and diagonally implicit Runge-Kutta methods, so ERK for explicit Runge-Kutta, DIRK for diagonally implicit, um, derived in coordination to guarantee accuracy of each method as well as their coupling, okay. So there will be built-in coefficients providing from third to fifth order accurate methods, and they may also be run in purely explicit or purely implicit modes. Um, and what, what this is going to give us is uh, one-step solvers that can work naturally with spatially adaptive PDE simulations. So Dan's been using sundials for a long time. He's been working a lot in AMR. And one of the issues with the linear multi-step methods is we do rely on previous state information. And when you have an adaptive grid situation, the number of unknowns is going to change and where they are in, the, in space is going to change. And so prior states need to be either interpolated or, or um, you start the integration back at, at first order. And so the idea of the multi-stage solvers is that you're not using prior time information, but you're evolving, you're doing multiple solves within a single stage in order to get a good um, higher order solution. And so this is going to equip sundials with the multi-stage integrators in a way that will hopefully be efficient and will uh, leverage a lot of the technology that we've had with the error control and, and be able to bring that in. So we're looking forward to that, and I think that'll be a very nice uh, enhancement. So hopefully next year, if, I, if you come back here, uh, we'll have some things to say about the R code uh, package as well. Okay, so data structures and iterative solvers um, match the rest of sundials. There's, again, the general vector-based implementation. Uh, uses the inexact Newton methods and all of the framework and infrastructure in place there. Uh, and for s serial problems like us, we can, he can have the uh, use LAPAC as well for the modified Newton type methods. And you can get more information off his website. Okay, so applications of sundials. Uh, I don't want to go into too much depth. Um, we've used sundials in lots of applications in lots of DOE areas uh, for fusion simulations. Dan's been doing some work with SMU. Um, also been doing some work with uh, cosmology uh, with some folks at uh, San Diego. Kinsol has been used for implicit hydrodynamics and core collapse supernova in uh, Stony Brook. Uh, the LNL's magnetic fusion energy division has been using CVOD in their BOUT++ code. Uh, Kinsol with the hyper multigrid preconditioner has been used in porous media flows very extensively. Um, CVOD, Kinsol, IDA all have been used for neutral particle transport problems. Um, sensitivity analysis uh, for chemically reacting flows uh, in SIDAC collaboration with Sandia Livermore in combustion. Uh, we've, we've seen some folks at Livermore have been using it for uh, 
some pretty tough combustion problems. Um, there's been a very interesting uh, code that was coming out of the um, National Renewable Energy Lab that was using CVOD S and the sensitivities to do an optimization for energy producing algae simulation, which was kind of cool. I, I, I don't have any good simulations from that one. Um, but I wanted to say a little bit of, go into a little depth on one of these just to kind of give an example of you know, what this looks like. Um, so this is a stellar collapse simulation that we worked on. Um, it has to deliver very high accuracy over long periods of time. So they've got a lot of stuff. This is core collapse supernova. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the core of these things, a lot of chemistry that uh, actually limits the, um, because of very fast dynamic, limits the time step of an explicit method to something just really, really, really small. Um, so their dynamics in the core look like 10 to the minus 7, but they really like to take something that's closer to 10 to the minus 4 for a time step, and they really want to run out to like 10 seconds. Okay, so a 10 to the minus 7 time step for 10 seconds of simulation is a lot of time steps. And so uh, because they had a very fast dynamic that they didn't care about and they really wanted to track what was going on in the shock that it emits out of the, the supernova, uh, this was a good candidate to look at uh, implicit methods where before they had explicit. So that was what motivated us to look at this problem. Um, it is a fluid problem. Uh, Lagrangian hydrodynamics with self-gravity, conservation, things. I won't go into a lot of things. But we put a, a, a theta scheme in there for time step uh, to go before, between forward oil or backward oil or Craig Nicholson, um, and tried this out using Kinsol at every time step, and immediately ran into some problems. So uh, they're, they're discretization schemes, as one would imagine in working with hydrodynamics. Uh, they're nonlinear discretization schemes. Um, they had non-differentiabilities in uh, some of the switches they had for those nonlinear schemes, and that was causing a lot of problems with doing finite difference approximations to Jacobian vector products, as one could imagine. Um, so this came through their, their uh, flux limiters and artificial viscosity. Um, they increased the stability for the shocks that they wanted to look at, but resulted in discontinuities in the Jacobian. So our, our choice was to freeze the parameters for each Newton iteration and that gave us a smooth approximation to the Jacobian. We then approximated Jacobian entries at the start of each iteration using finite differences. So we're able to do something a little bit uh, ad hoc with them, but it was able to work quite well. And form the preconditioner by extracting only the spatially local entries that couple the variables within a given cell. So we used a very local preconditioning approach. I don't want to go into, de into depth there. Um, Scaling of the unknowns became really big because we had some of the fluid unknowns, some of the gravity equation unknowns, and, and things like that. And so we had to use uh, scale factors. Uh, so we were solving, say, H of U, but we had to have um, choice of D in there. Um, and so we had to look at you know, what was the typical magnitude of each variable and use that to scale the, the equation so everything got equal weight in the uh, convergence criteria. And actually, we had to make sure the D evolved in time because there was a lot of very dramatic changes that were going on. Um, they also had uh, positivity constraints, which were violated in the Newton updates um, that were causing some problems. And so we had to apply a log transform for density, temperature, and radius that needed to always be positive. And that added a little nonlinearity to the problem, but actually allowed everything to stay positive. Um, and when we did that, we were able to do the um, first radiation hydrodynamic coupled modeling of an entire proto-neutron star cooling. So that was kind of exciting. And uh, he got up, I think, um, that's a 15-second plot on the right. So we were able to get out to 15 seconds, taking 0.1% you know, of the number of time steps that the explicit method took. So even though the implicit time step was much more expensive because we were taking so many fewer of them, we had a nice win with that. So, um, but it was, you know, using some of these very sophisticated methods can be, uh, can look very easy at start, but there's a lot of things that come into it and a lot of uh, knowledge of the methods that needs to be married with the knowledge of the application. So I just wanted to point that out. But. Okay, so we, we did some work with Fusion. I'll skip over that um, and talk about availability. Uh, we are released under an open source BSD license, which means we don't require you to make your code open if you use our code, um, such as what some of the open source, I guess the, 
is it the GPL license requires that. Um, so we want to stay away from that. Uh, some of the publications, although I think the list is out of date, can be found at our, um, the NSDE website. Uh, but if you go to the Sundials website, you can get the individual codes for download. Um, you can download the whole suite. There's also uh, pretty extensive user manuals that go into a lot of the mathematical considerations as well as the code usage. Um, we also have a very active user group email list, and we've got a wonderful user group that helps answer each other's questions, uh, which is really nice. Um, and the team is down there, and I think that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for your time. Any questions for Carol? <clears throat> so, oh, yeah. All right. So, uh, when you showed the nonlinear solver, you said you could have bounds on the variables, right? Constraints, yeah. So, if you can have bounds on the variables in a nonlinear solver, why do you have to do a log transform on row? Why don't you just bound it? I think, actually, we may have done the, the core collapse supernova before we had the constraints on Kinsall. So how do you handle the constraints in the nonlinear solve? We cut the time. We cut the, the step. It's very straightforward. Uh, oh, you don't do semi-smooth or no. reduce space or anything? Correct. Uh, that will not always converge, right? Correct. I just have a question. Um, do the integrators provided by C CVOTE or IDA um, uh, contain the capabilities for like dense output? Uh, okay, what do you mean by that for the BDF methods? Well, just is there you know a way to get some sort of uh, you know a solution in between the time steps provided by the integrators? No. No. Okay. Okay. What's the, what's the status of the Python interfaces that have been maintained? We did not do that. There's a two or three groups out there that have developed Python interfaces to sundials. But uh, we have not, we were not involved in that development, nor do we maintain them. Yeah. But the authors are active on the user list. And so if you ask about it or go through the, um, the archives of the user list, you can you know, get info about them.